fight for freedom, that choose to lay down their lives for mankind. Lord, help us celebrate them today as we lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you're being seated, we're going to play a video. As the ushers are coming down, we've got a few, just a few announcements. If you're a veteran, would you please stand in here today? Yes, thank you so much for your time, your energy, your service. We appreciate you. Look around. Let's, let's keep it up. Yes, let's give, them, let's give them the honor that's due. That's right. We remember you and we honor you today for all that you have done. We do have, in your bulletin, we got some things coming up, so if you would check that out. Um, really, um, for the sake of time, uh, Thanksgiving the Bag's coming up, check that out. Uh, C12 groups, um, and there's a revival going to be starting this next weekend at Church of the Brethren. Check that out also in your bulletin. Is there anybody here for your first time today? First time guest? Back here? All right, right back here. Anybody else? First time guests? All right, let's welcome them to Cornerstone. It's good to have you. If you'll fill out that little card and see us after the service back at the Connect desk right outside the doors, we have a little gift for you just to say thank you for joining us today. Um, Bethlehem Walk is coming up. That will happen right here in Chanersville. Um, volunteers are needed this Saturday, November 19th. Um, they will be, uh, we will be, building Bethlehem, and we will get started at 8 a.m. at the Chandlersville Community Building. A meal will be provided by to volunteers later in the day. Bring along a cordless drill if you have one and join us. The more help we have, the easier it will be. Thank you very much. That's for the community over uh, in Chandlersville. Um, if you have any questions, see Roger. Roger, wave your hand back there. Um, he's the one heading that up, and he's the one that needs to help, and he's the one looking for power drills, evidently. Bring them along and you can help. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this time that we can give, this time that we can sow into your kingdom to advance this kingdom that you have given us uh, domain over and rule over today. Lord, we ask that you would just take these finances and bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we do have a special guest for you today. We have a special guest. His name is Joe Summers. Joe is his, and his wife, Crystal. Back there, Cameron's son, daughter-in-law, Kristen. Some of the others I don't know yet. I'll get to know them. So good to have each and every one of you. Um, Joe, Joe is the, um, the FCA Area District D uh, Director for West Central Indiana. He works with coaches and athletes from middle school, high school, and college. Joe is from this area, grew up in Terre Haute, but moved over here and spent some time in Byesville. I know, but it's good to have him. It's so good to have Joe. What a powerful man of God. What a powerful preacher. He's going to come today, and he's going to share, share a little bit, probably a little bit about FCA, but he's going to bring the word of God. Let's welcome Joe up here today. Thanks, 
Hopefully I did. There we go. Awesome. It's great to be with you all today. As uh, Pastor Jamie said, I pastored a church in Byesville, Ohio. You know, God sends us to dark places. <laughs> Just kidding. I pastored there for uh, almost 15 years, and uh, God did some great things there. My wife and I have been in ministry for 27 years, and uh, it's hard to believe that I get to do what I do right now. Um, God has strategically placed us. How many of you know that God will set you up if you let him? I know that uh, in my life, from the very time I started ministry, I felt like the Holy Spirit prompted into my heart that you're going to be ministering to young people from, uh, for the, your whole life. And even when I was pastoring a church, I was very involved. We started FCA at Meadowbrook High School and have been involved with that ever until we left. And God began to stir on our heart this opportunity to go reach coaches and athletes with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. How many of you know sports matters in this country? Yes, if you don't believe that, let me just kind of give you a little statistic. Last year's Super Bowl, the NFL spent $964.2 million to give every football player COVID tests. Almost a billion dollars just for COVID tests. Sports matters in this country. And God has strategically put FCA in a place where we have the opportunity to reach coaches and athletes with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I'd like to do is give you just a short video. This will kind of give you a little bit of the vastness of FCA, plus give you a little bit of our focus. Pay attention to the screen. In 1954, God implanted into the heart of a basketball coach a vision that sports could be used as a vehicle to share the message of Jesus Christ. This idea was so compelling that it impacted the influencers. There is a reason for this fellowship of Christian athletes. Athletics has a place. Why this thing of fellowship of Christian athletes seems to have arisen in the mind of a few men. But not just two or three gathered together. But millions of people everywhere dedicated to a common cause. The potential is almost beyond conception. Think of the power of this group through all the nations of the world. And that influence continues today. Nearly seven decades later, that vision is a reality. Ministering to and through the coach. Once we've engaged coaches and athletes, we're then equipping them, we're serving them to ultimately empower them, men and women who are disciples who make disciples influence athletes from young age all the way up to the pros. Now is such a critical time. Sport is larger than it ever has been. I see FCA being more relevant today than at any other time in history. Right at this very moment, our society, we are removing ourselves from the Word of God. So we produce FCA Bibles, God's Word, put to the culture and athlete hands. Our camps continue to grow around the world. That's where I felt God's presence the most. Our numbers are growing. More cultures are joining a team. Doors opening, now serving in over 84 different countries. Truly fulfilling that vision. There's more to coaching than just winning medals. It's really about the impact you have in others' lives. I didn't get saved in a church. The FCA met me right where I was. We come to you exactly where you're at. By first reaching the coach, we have the opportunity then to reach every athlete. Uh, that's my job, raising leaders. And that's what's so powerful about the FCA. It's changing the dynamic of ministry. They go where you are. The ripple effect you're having on these kids and these coaches. And they're going to affect the community for generations. We want to walk through school and people see us and they'd be like, hey, I know that's a Christian because of the way we act. 
If we can change two people a day, just imagine how much that will grow. The impact, it goes full circle. I do still have that. It carries generations and generations. We can reach every coach, every athlete, every community, every country. To see the world transformed by Jesus Christ through the influence. The influence. The influence. Coaches and athletes. The FCA. Fulfilling. The vision. One of the things that I, yeah. One of the things that I love about FCA is it goes to places that the church can't go to. We're in the front line ministry, ministering to coaches and athletes. I'm going to share some testimonies of just what's going on just in our little West Central Indiana. I'm the area director there. We have 10 counties that I represent. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in my car. But uh, God has blessed us so great. We go from middle school through college. Let me just share a couple of quick testimonies this morning. Middle school, we just started last year. We just started a middle school, at one, uh, a, a huddle at one of our middle schools. I went there at the beginning of school year this year. The room is completely packed out. Kids are standing room only. They're ministering to one another, teaching each other the word of God. And God is doing some amazing things on that campus. Went to a high school. We have... Uh, an event that FCA does every year is called Fields of Faith. We had ours two weeks ago. And when we had a Fields of Faith event, we, had, we invited all of our whole area there. We had over 150 people in attendance. 25 gave their hearts to Christ for the first time or recommitted their lives to Jesus at that event. We have two huddles that started at two brand new high schools that didn't have FCA. God is moving. At our college campus, We've got, I've got five colleges in my area. One of the college athletic directors came up to me this August and he said, would you mind coming and speaking to all of our athletes? We have a meeting that they're all required to come to. I'll give you 10 minutes. Would you mind just coming and encouraging them and speaking into them? And I thought about it for about a half a second and said, absolutely. But then I had a question. I said, so can I share Jesus? And he said, sure, that would be fine. So I had an audience at St. Mary of the Woods College with over 300 athletes in a gymnasium for 10 minutes talking about how they have one shot at life. And if you've got one shot at life, you better run your best play with your best effort. And your best play is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And to be able to do that. And one of the things that FCA does, you heard it in the video, we give out Bibles. In the last year, we've given over 300 Bibles out in our area. At this particular event uh, for the athletes, we had an FCA table. That huddle at St. Mary's just started last year. I went to that huddle last year. They have five kids in attendance. It was doing well as disciples, making disciples. Went to, spoke there, had nothing to do with the speaker, but God was moving in that service. After the time was up, we gave away 50 Bibles, 75 students signed up for the FCA huddle. The next week, they had over 65 in attendance. God is moving and doing great things on our college campuses. We have, there's a university called DePaul University. It's in Greencastle, Indiana. DePaul, if you know anything about DePaul, not DePaul, which is in Chicago, but this is DePaul. It ends with a W. It's uh, one of the most liberal universities in our country today. God put it on the heart of a basketball player. He calls me up. He says, Joe, I just feel like God's calling me to start a huddle on my campus. I said, well, let's pray about it. Let's talk about it. Let's dive into this and see what that looks like. This year, I, I spoke at that huddle just about a week ago, Pastor. And when I went to that huddle, that room is completely packed full of students hungry for Jesus. God is doing amazing things on the campuses. The unfortunate part is all we hear is the negative, but God's doing something amazing. He's up to something big, why? Because we have to understand, church, that Jesus was, is, and for whatever will be the only hope for our world today. When that becomes ingrained in your heart, God will do something amazing. This morning as we approach the, the word of God today, I just want to, uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. 
this time of year, many of us are starting to look forward to that family time together, asking questions like, who are we gonna share Thanksgiving meal with at our house? Where are you planning to go for the holidays? And inevitably, somewhere, some way, that's gonna be a table that you're gonna be sitting around to eat. I know at our house, when our kids were growing up, one of the things that we always wanted to do was make the table a sacred place. It was a place where they could invite friends. It was a place where we could have meals together. We put distractions aside. Cell phones went on the counter. Uh, we didn't have anything going on other than just the opportunity to what? Eat a good meal together, yes. But the important part of being together at mealtime was to develop deeper levels of connection with one another. And I believe there's a call of God today to the body of Christ that says, hey, I'm giving you an invitation to come to the table. Why? Because I desire a deeper level of connection with you. And so this morning, as, as we uh, go through that, I, I believe that God is wanting us to come and to share our thoughts, our day, our emotion, our love, our life with him with our Savior, with our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and to invite others to come and be a part of that table experience as well. I read a statistic just this last week. It said this, 80% of practicing Christians have a positive view of church. I was a little alarmed by that. I think that number should be, that's a little low. Four out of five people that come to your church have a positive view of church. But the next number was pretty astonishing, 21% of non-Christians think of the church in a positive way. One out of every five. That's a pretty big gap. And I wonder why that is. I, I sat and I pondered that for a little bit. Why is that? And I think part of it has to do with the fact that we as the body of Christ have become, and dare I say, a little lazy. I want us to look at this passage of scripture. It's in Revelation chapter three, before we get there, I want us to understand that the audience of this passage is the church at Laodicea. I want to give you a little bit of background about this church. This church was one of the wealthiest church, probably the wealthiest church in the first century. The wealth was so great that in AD 60, there was a, a huge earthquake that leveled the entire city and instead of going to Rome for help, instead of going to the region for help, they rebuilt the city on their own. They had that much vast resources. The city was known for three major things. They were known for a vast wealthy and banking system. They were basically the New Testament Wall Street. They were also known for a textile industry that was huge, and they specified, they specifically were, uh, specialty was black wool cloth. It was also a place that had a large and famous medical school, and they were famous for having an eye salve that they would put over the eyes of people to make them well. But God looks at this church and all three of these things they were famous for, all three of the things that they're proud of, God looks at them and he says, you're lacking. There's something that you're lacking. And when God takes their spiritual temperature, he pronounces that they're sick. I want us to read this passage. It's in Revelation chapter three, verse 14. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, Thus the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation, I know your works, that you're neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, because, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you, maybe your version says spew you, out of my mouth. For you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that you're what? Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And check out what he says here. I advise that you buy from me gold, refined by the fire, so that you may be rich. 
white clothes that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. And then verse 20, see, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. Lord, I pray right now, would you just allow the spirit of the Lord, our ears are open. God, let our hearts be attentive, God, to what you're saying to us this morning. Because God, no matter what happens here, the most important thing is that we came to see you. We came to hear from you. So God, put me behind you and let the word of God just speak to my heart through us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning I want us to know a few things. Number one is this, God knows and sees everyone. God knows and sees everyone. Look at what he says here. He says, I know your works. Now, I know that salvation is not from works. There's not enough things that you could do that would merit salvation. We are saved by grace and grace alone. I could never earn that. However, there's a passage of scripture in James that says this. It says, faith without works is dead. And Jesus says this. He says, I know your works that you're neither cold nor you're hot. In other words, this. You're not passionate about anything. You're just kind of existing. You're just kind of getting by. You're just kind of sitting around. You know, we talk about coming to the table. How many of you remember whenever you were a kid? I, I, when I was a kid at my grandma's house, we had the kid's table, right? How many of you still sitting at the kid's table? You know, one of the things that I, I remember about the kid's table that was so cool was this. At the kid's table, people served us because they didn't want us to get in the way at the big table. So they would serve us at the kids' table. It was so easy. You just come up, you find a place to sit, and you sit down, and the food was there, the drink was there, the silverware was there, everything was there. Everything I needed to eat and to be satisfied was right there at the kids' table. And I think about that for just a moment, and I think we've got so many people in the body of Christ that are stuck at the kids' table. We have been served we have had all of the stuff just given to us and we've never gone out and tasted to see that the lord was good ourselves we never went to the place where the food was we were always dependent upon somebody else to bring the food to us we never had the devotion time for ourselves we never set aside the time with god for ourselves we never got passionate about anything because at the kids table is the place where lukewarmness begins and the Bible says this about lukewarm people, that it makes him sick. Did you catch that? I think sometimes we kind of read through that and we kind of gloss over that. It says that it makes God sick. It vomits. I love that. I don't love vomit. But I love what he says there. That man, it makes me want to vomit. It makes me just throw up. I got to tell you, I'm a sympathetic puker. I feel, you can all feel very sorry for my wife. When my kids were small, I couldn't help when they got sick. I, she was the hero there. She got in there, she held their hands, she uh, cleaned up the mess, she did all this stuff. I couldn't even, when she got sick, I, you doing okay, honey? I could go get ice, I could get water, I could get a wash rag, I could do those things and kind of sneak them through the door. But I was, if it was, it was bad, I just, you know, sorry, baby, you're on your own, right? And I wonder, I wish that there were more people in the body of Christ that got sick about the things that made God sick. That we would call out lukewarmness, that we would encourage one another towards serving the God with passion and with fire. And I honestly think as we gather around the table, that's exactly what he's called us to do, to encourage one another, to build each other up, but to understand where our substance comes from. And in that relationship that we have with God, those are the things that bring fire and passion. And he says, listen, I would rather you be passionate about the things of God than lukewarm sitting at and satisfied with the kid's table. 
But the only way you'll ever find that is to understand that God is the one that sends out that invitation. Listen to what the, he describes the church in Laodicea. You're rich. You say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, and I need nothing. That's exactly the church in America today. And you don't re realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Remember the three things that this church is known for? Riches, gold. And he says, listen, you think you got gold, but you need to get gold from me. That's been refined in the fire. What's that mean? That means I need to value holiness in my life. You need to start valuing holiness. Then he says this, you need to change those black wool clothes for some white clothes. There needs to be a time of repentance in your life where the old things pass away and all things become new. And then he says, There's, you think you have ointment for your eyes? I've got an ointment for your eyes. It's called the anointing. And I will anoint you if you will come and live a life of holiness. If you will come and repent and say, God, I just want to serve you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. You know what he's going to do? He's going to anoint your eyes so that you can see things the way he sees them. And there's vision there. It's God who extends the invitation. It's God who extends the invitation. It's by grace that he invites us to the table. Do you remember the time he invited you to the table? I remember the time he invited me to the table. It was an Easter Sunday morning. I'm going to tell my age now, about 37 years ago. Our church was such that we had these big pillars in the middle, and I always sat on that side, and I had a specific place exactly where my parents couldn't see me and the pastor couldn't see me. And I hid behind that pillar. And it was an Easter Sunday morning, and there was a buddy of mine, he was there, and man, he was just chatty Cathy the whole service. So I couldn't tell you what the message was probably about. But he left 10 minutes before it was over. And in that 10 minutes, the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of my heart. I grew up at church my whole life. Many of you probably heard this saying, I had a drug problem. My parents drugged me to church every Sunday but I had no relationship with God. You know, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. I can attest to that. I know for me, that Sunday morning, God transformed my life. And step of growing, growth, disciples who make disciples, growing closer to him, trying to invest my, my heart into things, and God called me to the ministry. I remember that invitation. I think sometimes it's easy to forget when God did something in your heart. It's been so long ago. Never forget that. It's the most powerful thing that you possess is your testimony. You know why? Because it's yours. Nobody can take that away from you. That's your experience with the God of all creation who came and saved you out of the miry clay and set your feet upon a rock. Don't you ever discount that. Don't you ever forget that. Why? Because that's the very thing that brings you to the table. The second thing is that it's important that we see clearly with anointed eyes. I believe God is wanting us to invite others around the table. That's one of the reasons that drew me to FCA. Um, I just felt God was calling us in that direction. And once that began, that, that step began to happen, I could go through everything. It was just a God-ordained thing. Boom, 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 boom. Because how many of you know I put out fleeces? I'm, a really, I'm originally from Terre Haute, Indiana, and the last thing I wanted to do was go home. If you've ever been to Terre Haute, Indiana, Steve Martin called it the armpit of America. And if you've ever been to Terre Haute, you know there's just not a whole lot there. I got some family that live there. It's a great place to raise kids. It's a great place to grow up. But I never had aspirations of going back there. But all of a sudden, God started opening the door. And one by one, steps began to come. And I began to see the things that God wanted us to do, that thing that God was having and laid out for our life. Can I ask you this? Can you see the things that God has in your life? 
The Bible says that uh, I know the plans for Jeremiah 29, 11. We love it. It's a Hobby Lobby. You can go down and pick one up. I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. All of those wonderful things that you find on Vault Hobby Lobby. But I wish that they would put 12 and 13 on there. Because the key to 11 is 12 and 13. Because it says, but you'll find me if you'll seek me. If you call out to me, I will hear you and answer your prayer. And you will find me if you what? Seek me with all of your heart. And if we seek God with all of our heart, he begins to open our eyes and we get to begin to see things differently. When you begin to seek God with all your heart, the lukewarm to things doesn't satisfy anymore. You want a passion inside your heart. Finally, I think it's important that we hear clearly. Notice verse 20, it says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'm gonna come and eat with him. In other words, what? I'm gonna come to the table and we're gonna eat together. I remember that this passage was written to the church. It wasn't written to the world. It was written to the church at Laodicea. I stand at the door and knock. I need to hear his voice. The question is, do you hear his voice today? You know, sometimes we hear a lot. Of, it, it, what is your head? Sometimes our head is full of voices. We hear a lot of things from a lot of different people from a lot of different areas. But do you, can you pick out his voice? When the storm is raging all around you, can you hear the voice of the one who's telling you to be still? I'll get you through. Illustration, and then I have a, a closing video before we wrap this up. When I was a kid, I remember we used to go out and play in the neighborhood. You remember those days? Get on your bike, you'd leave in the morning, you'd be gone all day, and about dinner time, mom had this bell. And it was a big old loud bell, and there was like a three or four block area that we would always be in, and she'd ring this bell, and she'd holler out my name. Time for dinner! Right? And I knew, as the sun was starting to go down, that kind of, I knew about the time of day that that was gonna happen, and so what did I need to do? I needed to listen for her voice. And it wasn't very loud, because she was usually about a block away from me, but it wasn't always very loud, but I always was attuned to listen to that voice. You know why? Because if I didn't listen to the voice, she was getting in the car. <laughs> and if she had to go in and get the car keys and get in the car, that was never good, right? And I learned to listen for that voice because I knew that whenever that voice was calling out, it was time to come to the table. And I wonder today, what voice are you listening to? There's an illustration, I'm showing video, it probably does this better justice than I could ever do. It's just entitled, The Voice. That is not the voice. <laughs> Was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? I'll tell you what, I'll come up and tell you the rest. So this pastor decides that, this lawyer decides he's gonna get on with the pastor and he gets in the plane, they begin to start. He gets up in the air and the pastor tells him this. He says, I forgot to tell you that whenever I start to fly in clouds, I pass out. And so they're starting, it had been cloudy all day. And they're in the clouds and it wasn't, probably 30 seconds later, the pastor's eyes kind of roll back and he's out cold. The two guys that are sitting in the cockpit, one of them turns to the other one and says, we're gonna die today, aren't we? He says, that's quite possible. He says, here's what I want you to do, there's a radio, get on the radio. So he gets on the radio and he says, help, help. And as he calls out for help, 
someone who's flying by hears him and says, help, you must not be someone that's familiar with our lingo. He says, no, our pilot's passed out. We're trying to get to Anchorage. He says, I tell you what, I will stay with you. I will link you to Anchorage and we'll get you in. As he's flying toward Anchorage, he hears this voice come across the radio. He says, this is Anchorage, the tower. And he says, I need you to do something very important to me. He said, I understand your pilot's passed out and you're flying this plane with no experience. Yes, sir. And he says this, he says, I need you to, whatever you do, I need you to listen to my voice. You can't see me, but I can see you. And he says, I need you to listen to my voice because if you don't, you'll die. In about three minutes, you're gonna be coming up on a mountain and you need to turn. And he gives him the coordinates to turn. He says, if you don't listen to my voice, you will die and crash into the mountain. As he begins to fly around the mountain and comes toward Anchorage, storms are raging. There's all kinds of things going on, lightning's flashing, wind's blowing. He's trying to hold the plane still. And he says, okay, we're gonna land this thing. And he's talking me through, he said, now listen to my voice. As you come to the end of the runway, there's, you're gonna see lights that are in the form of a cross. And as you begin to land this plane, I want you to focus on nothing but that cross. In the midst of God's storm, if you hear the voice, the voice will always lead you to the cross. He lands the plane. The person that's over the, in, in the tower says this, listen, thank you for listening. I've seen them come here many times in that same situation and they crash and they burn and they die because they won't just simply listen to the voice. They get so flustered with all the things that are going around them, all the things that are happening, the storm that they're facing, the circumstances that they're in, and they forget to do one thing and that's listen to my voice. Thank you for listening. About five o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on his hotel room in Anchorage, Alaska. And the man said, thank you. He just opened the door and the man introduced himself. He says, you're the voice. You're the one that brought us home. You know, in this world today, there's a lot of voices that try to cloud your head. Voices of insecurity, voices of doubt, voices of, of trouble, turmoil, all the things that goes on in this world voices of politics, voices of all the things that we try and we worry ourselves with. But can I ask you a question? What voice are you listening to this morning? Would you bow your heads, please? Father, today, I pray that we would hear your voice clearly today. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not accepted Christ or maybe you've found yourself in that place of being lukewarm. And you would say, you know, Joe, I'm hearing the voice of God to come to repent. I need to get back into giving my life to be passionate about the Lord. I need to give my life to Jesus today. If that's you this morning, would you just slip up your hand? We wanna pray with you today. Is there anyone here today? Man, I'm hearing that voice. I'm hearing that voice. Praise the Lord. Finally, before I pray today, I, I wanna ask you this question. Maybe you're like the church of Laodicea and you're just getting by. Just come in, you punch your time clock on Sunday, but that's about it when it comes to your walk with Jesus. There's no passion. There's no heartfelt going after God. Can I just tell you this? God has a purpose and a plan for everyone, but we have to listen to the voice, get a passion from God and connect with him. And today I, I think the invitation for you to come get off the kid's table and come to the big table, come to where the father is, so that you can get instruction and guidance from him. God has so much in store for your life. That's what makes the church in Acts so awesome. 
They were anointed, they were filled with the Spirit, they lived life together, but they listened to the voice of what God was speaking to their heart. And so today I ask you that same question. Is that you? Is that you? Father, this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak and let our hearts and ears listen. Maybe there's some here this morning that their, their voice is, that your voice is just clouded amongst all the rest of them, man. They've got family issues. They've been listening to the political climate the last week. They've been doing things that, that man, their sinful nature has enjoyed. But God, I pray today, let there be a line drawn in the sand that says, I'm not gonna be listening to that kind of thing. I'm going after God. I want his heart. He stands at the door and he knocks. And I want to listen for his voice and obey his commands. And today I pledge to do that. Would you just right now, just you and the Lord, just make that commitment as Pastor Jamie comes. You and Jesus, I'm going to listen to his voice. Let's thank Pastor Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you for your dedication and commitment not only to the service of Jesus Christ that steps out there and seeing multitudes of young people, which absolutely need it very, very vitally right now, but thank you for coming today, here today, and bringing that word. What a great word it was. Thank you so much. Thank we love you. and appreciate you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank Thanks, you. brother. People out there, um, stop out and see him. He's got a bunch of neat stuff there, a lot of cool things. If you have a teenager, especially if you have a teenager that's in any type of athletics or somebody that, uh, that uh, would, would, would appreciate something like that, stop out there and talk to him. He's got a real, lot of good stuff. There's some things over here from um, LifeWise. They're trying to raise some money for um, different things for Christmas, so stop out there and see them. Um, it's going to be... Uh, a lot of stuff going on out there, but we want to thank you and appreciate you for coming today. We love you. Thank you for being here. If you want to stick around for another service, we got one coming at 1030. Remember, remember this. If you signed up or if we talked to you about pastor's luncheon, it will be right at noon today in the fellowship hall. If you are new to the church and you have not, uh, if you've not received or if you've not talked to the pastor, please come at noon today and we'll have a meal for you and we'll be, uh, uh, excited to see you there. So have a blessed day. We love you.